Speaking next on the proposition, we have Rupa Huck. If I can just change my sheet over. Uh, Rupa Huck is a Labour Party politician, columnist and academic, and has been the Member of Parliament for Ealing Central and Acton since 2015. She is currently on the panel of chairs in the House of Commons and a member of the Brexit Select Committee and was formerly the Shadow Home Office Minister for Crime Prevention. She is also a graduate of Needham College, Cambridge, where she had political and social sciences and law and has authored four books on the sociology of youth culture and the suburbs. Rupa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madam President. And what a joy it is to be back in my alma mater as a friend of America. I want to make that point completely clear from the start. I'm a frequent visitor there. In fact, I should have been there from this weekend onwards, but corona for the second time this year. But coronavirus put paid to that. So why am I speaking on this side of the house today? It's because if you are a good friend, you're able to speak honestly to your good friends. And um, I want to make the claim, well, look, I could easily say that if you look at the COVID Olympics, America has the highest death toll. It has 22 million unemployed. I could say case closed. That shows that the end is nigh for American supremacy. But instead, that would be quite a short speech, though. So instead, I want to sort of make the case geopolitically, economically, even socio-politically and morally, and kind of rather than blaming it all at the door of Donald J. Trump, I want to make the case that, you know, that from all those angles, the fabric of America was fraying for some time pre-pandemic as well. So if you think of the notion of the American dream, the whole sort of, hi, honey, I'm home, motherhood and apple pie stuff, um, it, you know, America's meant to be the land of opportunity for all. Innovation, you know, they invented the atomic bomb and detonated it, the Model T Ford, all these things. You know, great things that this country did, all buttressed by Uncle Sam's superiority in military might, morally, things like the Nuremberg trials, many of these global justice initiatives came from them. But if you think to the turn of the millennium, uh, probably most of you weren't, even born then, but people started talking of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, that were threatening that supremacy. And on my visit in 2009, I remember learning a completely new word to my vocabulary, foreclosure. In this country, we call that uh, repossession. And it was a sort of sign that was hung on many houses, these ideal homes that were built for suburban dreams. And, you know, that 2009 recession bit really hard. So, you know, even from then, the idea of the American dream, the supremacy was taking a bit of a knock. And that 08 cra um, crash, I think, was a pivotal point. So, and, and it's recognized in Trump's own slogan, make America great again. It has connotations, doesn't it, of a kind of faded grandeur. And, you know, Trump, if he was here um, and our last speaker, they could all make that claim of growth up, unemployment down, consumer confidence rising. But that's also tempered with all these other factors, the outsourcing of manufacturing to the Far East. So places like Detroit, you've seen hollowed out neighborhood cities. It used to be known for car production. Now it's the home of house music. You know, we've also seen poverty pay, a gig economy, and a safety net that you could say at best has very big holes in it, at worst is non-existent. That's not down to Trump, I have to say. Um, and we've gone from, uh, you know, my own, uh, the baby boomers, for years and years, those are the people at the top of the political tree. And then you have generations like my own, Generation X, we were called, I was born in 1972. And then we've gone from there to the millennials. And, you know, if you think about, I don't know if people know pop music here, Once in a Lifetime by Talking Heads, it talks about a beautiful house and a beautiful wife and how did I get this life? And then you go to the 90s, Nirvana, never mind, the sort of nonchalance, the baby chasing the dollar bill. After that 08 crash, phrases were popularised like the 99%. Capitalism in crisis, which kind of recognized the asymmetry of being the world's biggest global economy. The spoils are not evenly distributed. I think it's sort of widely recognized. And now we face this COVID recession to beat all recessions. This summer, you can't have failed to notice that cities have been ablaze in the country that once prided itself, didn't it, as a land, a nation of immigrants. And a kind of country where when you go there, you see it's got its little Italy's, it's got its Chinatowns, 
bagel joints, reflecting that rich diversity. This summer, we saw eight minutes and 47 seconds that shocked the world, the killing of Brother George. Floyd's suffocation at the hands of the police, and that resonated all over the place. Uh, the riverbank in Bristol, the statue of King Leopold in Brussels. And usually you'd have a president who'd want to heal these kind of divisions, but instead you've got one who's stoking up all these tensions. He kind of flirts with white supremacy. He's got this 40-a-day habit of tweets, anything that enters his mind. It's no wonder that even ex-Republicans, the Lincoln Project, see that their party has been hijacked by a demagogue who pals around with dictators like Putin and that rocket man bloke Kim Jong-il, pandering to, you know, in a country that people like the, the former George Bush II have disowned him. And, you know, we are in a country, that America is now a non-majority white country. That was seen as a demographic tipping point, but he's sort of using this, stoking up fears. And we do have an election now that, um, on both sides, fears of the future is defining the politics of the present. So, you know, people are trying to scare the other side. And it sometimes feels like that other tagline of his, I mean, he's got various ones, hasn't he? There's also lock her up, um, send them home, four more years. But there's America first, that rhetoric flies in the face of the fact that the United States was at the heart of all these multilateral organizations. And it's meant it's a shrunken force on the world stage. So in 2018, there was a G7, and that was after the Salisbury uh, uh, poisonings. It was argued by Trump that it should be a G8, let Russia in. That's just kind of really un-American. And when that didn't uh, find favor with the other members, he threw a strop. He didn't sign up to the global communique. So again, the whole idea of the rules-based international order, this is a man who poo-poos all those ideas. He's also pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords, as my honorable friend alluded to, the United Nations Refugee Program, funding uh, Palestinian community refugees, the Iran nuclear deal, the list goes on and on. He's been huffing and puffing about how he's overpaying for NATO, the policies of caging and separating kids on the border from their parents, the obsession with Mexican rapists, building a wall that became a fence, a Muslim ban, his, his kind of sneering at veterans, people that have fought and died so that we have the free world that we do, including John McCain, another Republican notable person who's disowned him. So this person is a break from the norm. And if you think about democratic institutions, they're also fundamental to the healthy functioning of any society, but they're coming under enormous pressure and strain. We've seen this week the appointment of the Supreme Court judge. You know, the last one wasn't even, the body wasn't even cold. People are voting in real time in an election that's pending. This is completely unprecedented to try and move the goalposts in this way. And, you know, always the smooth transition of power has been taken as a given. This guy is not going to relinquish the reins of power without a fight. We can see that already. And he's left a trail of his ex-staffers in his wake. I think Omarosa is going to be one of our speakers tonight. They're all written a book to cash in on it. John Bolton, uh, Scaramucci. There's so many of these people who seem to serially piss off. Oh, sorry, unparliamentary language. Uh, <laughs> forgive me. And, you know, don't get me started on the iniquitous electoral college twice in this century. We're only in a young century. It's thrown up a result. It's given the crown to a president who didn't even win the popular vote. I mean, look, I'm not going to go round, down the road of arguing that America is a sort of failed state or a rogue state, because I do, as a friend of America, as I say, a, a long-time visitor, some years I go twice in a year, I've always liked American popular culture, all those kind of things. Their separation of powers, I learned about at school and thought, we need a written constitution too. I'm not going to argue that, because I think this is actually all fixable. But, I mean, no country has a God-given right to supremacy indefinitely. And if you think about previous uh, empires, the, the fall of Rome, you know, these things come to an end. My parents were always taught in what was then um, India, pre-independence India, the sun never sets on the British Empire. That came to the end. We've got to face up to the thing. We're a clapped out ex-colonial power. And superpowers fizzle and fade. So we have seen in history bubonic plague, black death, all these things, you know, they resonate with what we see now. We've gone from Plato to NATO, and now we're in a sort of post-NATO era next. So, Madam President, the old ideas 
of the US as a pioneering world power where anyone can make it, that keeps the world safe with its global leadership all the way since 1945 are coming under strain with political polarization at home and abroad, an increasingly complex world. And, you know, but the end is nigh. The wording of this phrase, I'd ask you to consider when you're doing your vote, it doesn't mean we're there yet. We can swerve to avoid it. America's lost moral authority can be regained. Its, uh, its place as the land of unbridled opportunity can be fixed. So what I would say, Madam President, is if you have a vote next week, use it wisely. We may see the convulsions of the Trump era come to an end soon. But if you don't, do the next best thing and support this motion tonight. That's what I want to say. God bless America. Thank you, Madam President.